Would you choose to live forever? Should you choose to live forever? What if I gave you that choice, gave you the option of taking a pill that would allow you to live forever, or maybe an elixir, a little vial of liquid? Um, people disagree about this. Uh, people have been wondering about it for forever, as long as there have been human beings. Perhaps the first literary depiction of, of this, this uh, drive for immortality is in the Mesopotamian, the Epic of Gilgamesh, in which uh, a young man loses his best friend who was a soldier in a war. And um, he was so disturbed by all of this that uh, he went on a journey looking for ways to get greater and greater longevity and to live forever, to avoid death. Uh, so the human fear of death or the drive to avoid death has been with us for millennia forever. Um, and the desire to live forever similarly. Uh, but people are ambivalent about it. You may be ambivalent. I'd like you to think about this question as, as we discuss it. There is a great uh, book which gives the history of thoughts about immortality, written by Gerald Grumman in the 1960s. And what he points out is forever there have been prolongivists and apologists. The prolongivists are positive about living forever. They would say, yes, I would choose to live forever. I would take the elixir. And the apologists would not. They're negative. Uh, they're not optimistic and they would not choose the pill. They, they, they say you shouldn't choose the elixir. So what I want to do is talk about this ambivalence, talk about both sides of the question. When I asked that question, did you right away think, yes, it's obvious, I want to live forever, life is good, and, I, and the more I have of it, the better. Or did you think, boy, that's pretty scary. Uh, I've seen old people and often they're really impaired, they might be suffering, they might be in pain, I don't, they might have lost a lot of their memories, I don't want to be like that. So you have this deep ambivalence. Uh, the first thing I'd like to do though is uh, think about why you would want to be immortal. When I first started thinking about this and started reading some of the philosophical literature on the question, I thought it's just obvious Death is, is terrible, or at least it can be terrible. And when you lose a loved one, that, that can be one of the worst things in your life. And again, uh, the whole thought of dying prematurely, at least, um, it's, it's, it's scary. Uh, it's um, something that many of us are terrified by. In fact, there's a whole theory started by the uh, social scientist Ernst, Ernest Becker in his book, The Denial of Death, in which he talks about managing the terror of death. Uh, he calls it terror management theory. So many of us don't want to die and we want to live more, but why? Um, I think the idea is more is better, more of what's good in my life. So think about it, what do you value? What gives meaning to your life? What makes it a more meaningful life? And what do you enjoy? Uh, so, of course, people differ about this. We have different personalities. We have different interests, different projects. But think about your loved ones, your family, your very close friends, your colleagues, your teammates, the kinds of relationships of love and commitment and marriage and friendship and collegiality and teamwork those are some of the things that give us meaning. Also, a nice walk and enjoying solitude and reflection, that can be both enjoyable and uplifting and pleasurable and meaningful. Um, following sports, uh, taking part in sports, uh, watching your children grow, grow up, all of these are wonderful things that can give us meaning. And then we have lots of pleasures as well. The pleasure of eating delicious food, pleasure of uh, enjoying music. What's your favorite music? Uh, the pleasure of, again, taking a walk by the beach uh, at sunset or being in the mountains in the Sierras, in the high Sierras or the Alps 
and taking a hike and seeing the sun, sunrise, perhaps, over the mountains. These are all incredibly pleasurable things. They don't have to be high pleasures. They, you, you might just enjoy having a cheeseburger and french fries or a delicious stir fry. Um, food is, is wonderful. And um, so many, many activities give us enjoyment. Many are rewarding. They add meaning to our lives. And more is better. Um, think about a finite life. Think about the lives we live, which are limited. Um, in duration. If I were given two choices, let's say, if I could step out of my life and, and, and God or someone says, okay, which life would you choose? And one has more of those things that I find valuable and meaningful and rewarding and pleasurable uh, than the other, I'm going to choose the life with more rather than fewer. And uh, that's a choice between two finite lives, but if I now am given a choice between a finite and an infinite or much longer life, I might say in the, mo in the longer life, there's an opportunity to have more of these things, more of these things that I really value. Uh, more is better, more of a good thing is, is better. Now, um, I think that's why we want to live longer and perhaps um, be immortal. Um, why would someone deny that, or why would someone call that into question? Um, this kind of forces us to be clearer, not only on what gives us meaning and pleasure in life, but about the question we're asking itself. Because, as I said, we might think about elderly people we know who have aged, perhaps gracefully, but now their body is deteriorating, their mind is deteriorating, they're impaired, they can't move around, they're in pain. And we can extrapolate and say, that's bad enough, I don't want that to continue. I don't want to live a life trapped in suffering and pain and impairment. Um, and so I think most of us, almost everyone would say, I don't want that kind of immortality. So we have to sharpen our question to make it an interesting question philosophically. Um, first of all, we're, we're going to think about secular immortality rather than uh, religious. In, term, uh, in a religious picture of living forever, there's an afterlife. Or you get reincarnated, perhaps. Uh, you yourself are now having a different body, perhaps, of an animal or a member of a different species. But also, of course, in the Judeo-Christian tradition um, and in Islam, uh, the monotheistic religions, typically there's an afterlife. Heaven, hell, limbo, purgatory, but you go, your soul perhaps, or a new body, a resurrection body, goes somewhere else. Um, so in a sense, you continue to exist. Some people even think that you could take the information in my brain, my mental information, take a picture of it, and then upload it to a computer. Um, and in some sense, they think I would then continue, even though I, I'm not embodied. We're not going to discuss the religious conception of living forever, although that it's a fasc fascinating question or set of questions about which we could have a different conversation. We're going to talk about the secular idea of living forever and not dying. But what is forever? That's also part of the, the puzzle. Um, one idea of forever is an infinite amount of time. So living forever would be living an infinite number of uh, days or years in the future, maybe till the heat death of the universe. Um, but it's kind of, it's extremely hard to wrap your mind around that kind of forever. Um, I think what, uh, you know, other, another conception of immortality that's more plausible as something we could aim at, even though it's not feasible right now to achieve it, would be what's called medical immortality or radical life extension. And medical immortality means you're not going to die of natural causes. You're not going to die because your body is deteriorating. Or you're not going to die of a disease. Your body, we've solved the problems of diseases and aging and bodily deterioration. Now you could still die because you're run over by a semi-truck or because you fall off a cliff. You could 
uh, engage or arrange for, let's say, physician-assisted suicide. So you could die, but you're not going to die from natural causes, from a disease. So um, how long would this be? Uh, it's hard to guess. It's hard to really have a firm grasp on it, but some social scientists have estimated around 6,000 years. On average, medical immortality would be about uh, 6,000 years. 6,000 years on average before someone murders you or you accidentally fall off a cliff or whatever happens to you. Uh, you're not going to die though of a, a virus or a bacteria. Um, now, that's a long time. You might say, hey, you're changing the subject. You asked me if I wanted to live forever, but now you're asking me, would you want to live for an average of 6,000 years? 6,000 years is a long time. And if you think about it, um, it's three times the amount of time since the historical Jesus. Um, so that is a very, very long time. And of course, if you're medically immortal, you could die tomorrow uh, or you could die in 10,000 years. It's just an average. So it's a little bit more plausible to think about that. We might go back and forth in our minds between true immortality and medical immortality, but medical immortality is going to be the focus. Also, we're going to ask, would you choose medical immortality under favorable circumstances? You're um, <clears throat> healthy, you have adequate food and shelter, the environment is clean. Um, all of these are, are, are things which we need in order to flourish and to live a happy, rewarding life. Adequate medical care, shelter, food, clean environment. We're assuming we have those. We've solved those problems, um, at least for you. We're also going to assume that uh, there will be other individuals who are also medically immortal. It doesn't have to be everyone, uh, but enough people that you could have companions and, and you could fall in love and have loving relationships and friendships with people your age, so to speak. Um, so you're not going to be the lone immortal. Some people think, I wouldn't want to be immortal because everyone would be dying, all my friends, my family. Um, and so, um, what we're going to assume is that there are a group big enough so you can have companionship and friendship. So <clears throat> what we're going to say, say is our question really is, would you, should you choose to live a medically immortal life under favorable circumstances? That's the interesting philosophical question. It's, it's a no-brainer to say, I wouldn't want to suffer, I wouldn't want to be in pain, I wouldn't be, want to be in terrible poverty, I wouldn't want to live in a really dirty environment. But the philosophical question is, would it still be a desirable thing? Would it be worthy of choice to take the pill that would allow you to live 6,000 years on average under favorable circumstances? Some people say yes, some people say no. Uh, but let's, start, let's focus on that question. I've tried to explain why someone wa might want that, because we want more of good things. More is better. Why would you be a, an apologist, as uh, Grumman said, or why would you say no? My term is a curmudgeon. Uh, an optimist says yes, to the pill, a curmudgeon says no, uh, has a negative attitude. Why? Well, because they say there more is better, but there is a law of diminishing marginal utility or diminishing marginal returns. And what that means is as you get more and more of something, each additional thing gives you less pleasure, less reward. So if you have an apple, that might give you a lot of pleasure. If you have two, the second one might give you a lot, but maybe a little less than the first. And as you go, the marginal apple, maybe if you have 12, is going to give you very little extra pleasure, unless you're making an apple pie or a, a bunch of apple pies and you need it. But there's a diminishing marginal utility or, or benefit as you get more and more of a good, famous economic law. So, but then what the um, curmudgeons point out is there may come a point as you get more and more of this good time, as you get more and more days and years, not only will the benefits diminish, but they'll go to zero. And not only will they go to zero, but at some point they'll be negative 
and eventually you'll get what I call the, uh, the marginal utility catastrophe. The marginal utility catastrophe, and what that means is adding more and more is going to destroy your life. It's going to destroy everything. It's not just going to be a zero value, but it's going to destroy everything. It's like, you might think more is better, so let's say a medication helps you. Um, and you might say, well, maybe more medicine will help me more. Maybe a little more medicine will. But at a certain point, more is not going to be beneficial. It's not going to give you, <clears throat> excuse me, it's not going to give you any extra benefit and it's going to start to harm you. And at some point, it will kill you to take that much medicine. Uh, maybe at some point, the apples will become rotten because you, you haven't used them. You're eating more, you're getting more and more apples. That's the idea. What, they, what the curmudgeons say is more is better to a certain extent, but once you get past a certain, let's say, number of days or number of apples, um, what's going to happen is your whole life is going to be destroyed. It's going to lose its form. It's going to lose its choiceworthiness because there's going to be a utility catastrophe. So, why exactly would you think that, though? The curmudgeons have different reasons. Uh, and again, we could talk for a long time, though perhaps not forever, about all the reasons people have said, no, no, I don't want to be immortal. It would create this utility catastrophe. It would blow up my personality. It would destroy me. One, though, of the most important and influential uh, reasons for uh, curmudgeonliness is boredom. What the curmudgeons worry about is that we will eventually become bored, alienated from our lives, no motivation, extreme, profound boredom. <clears throat> of course, we're bored sometimes quite a lot in our ordinary finite lives, but the idea would be there would be a profound boredom in immortality, a boredom that we couldn't escape and that would make our lives not worthy of living. And they, they might have metaphors for that, like one metaphor would be, if you think about being young and taking that summer trip, that holiday, in the station wagon, in the family station wagon, eventually it just becomes boring. You're sitting in the back and you start sometimes unraveling. Uh, you, you're, you're just so bored. Everything's the same, everything's tedious. Even as adults, if we're in long plane, uh, if we're taking a long plane trip, it can be boring. We can bring our reading, but we can watch movies, but at some point we're, we're bored. Um, and that seems to be the metaphor or one of the metaphors that drive a negative view about immortality. It's like being in the back seat of that station wagon when you're a kid. I know uh, our kids would start crying and, and, and falling apart, unraveling at a certain point as we were driving up the five freeway to San Francisco. Um, that's their picture. Um, I, only, I want to give you some reasons though for optimism. I am not a curmudgeon. I don't think we would inevitably become bored. So I want to give you a few reasons to think that we could find immortality worthy of choice. Uh, one is, if you think about pleasures, I don't see why they would, be, they would have to run out or how over time they would have to be, the activities couldn't be pleasurable anymore. Um, again, think of your favorite kind of food, um, how delicious it could be, your favorite music, how beautiful it can be. Um, think of travel and all the excitement that you get from travel. Why would those necessarily become um, boring eventually? I just don't see it. Now, I think you could think of it, uh, those things as necessarily boring if you make certain mistakes. One mistake would be, okay, you have to eat that, your favorite food every day for breakfast, lunch, dinner, for a midnight snack every day. You would get, obviously, no matter how good the food is, how delicious it is, it would begin to be boring and then it would be sickening. Um, if you listen to the same music, morning, noon, at night, all the time, uh, it becomes 
you know, it loses its appeal. It, uses it, it loses its pleasurable quality. But that's not the way we have to think of immortality. We can think of our pleasures um, distributed appropriately. Kierkegaard, the great uh, Danish existentialist, said a farmer has to rotate his crops in order not to deplete the nutrients in the soil. And just that, like a farmer has to ro rotate his or her crops, we have to rotate our pleasures. But they could still be pleasurable, I believe, if they're distributed in a sensible way. Um, think of spiritual experiences. We don't just have to think about pleasures, but prayer, meditation, awe, beauty. Think of uh, the awe that you have by the seacoast or uh, looking at the, the heavens, the stars above on a clear night. Those experiences can be compelling and I don't, uh, elevating, transcendent, compelling, I don't see how they would necessarily run out. Now if you were a monk and you prayed daily and that's all you did, or not a monk and you just tried to meditate all the time, it would not be possible to still get reward from that. But we're not talking about doing that relentlessly. Um, I think, in other words, and I've just kind of scratched the surface, but when you think more carefully, the curmudgeon might be making a mistake. They might be extrapolating from uh, actual elderly people and their suffering. Or they might be thinking you would have to bunch up, scrunch up uh, your experiences every day doing the same thing, and then extend that out relentlessly, not, not mixing your pleasures. But I imagine a life where I could have delicious food, I, I wouldn't have to eat the same kind of food every day, sometimes I could fast, uh, and I can engage in uh, walk, walking and hiking and all the, th the athletic things I want to do. Uh, I could travel, not necessarily to the same place all the time. I'm not traveling all the, all the time either. In a finite life, we have to be sensible about how we divide up our energies and distribute our, our, um, our time. So why apply a double standard? We can do the same thing if we live forever. So let me just say, when I thought originally about this question, I thought it was obvious. You should choose to live forever. You should take that pill. It's an age-old question. It's a very human question. It's an existential question. It's a question that we ask because we exist as human beings. So it's not going to be easy, but that's your homework assignment. <laughs> Think about it. Thank you.